Hello, uh, my name is Daphne Dragona. I'm a curator and a writer. I'm based in Berlin. And I recently curated um, the exhibition The Programming Earth, uh, which was initiated, organized, and hosted by NIM Art Center uh, in Lima Solo Cyprus. The exhibition opened uh, last November, and it's still going on now that uh, we are recording this uh, early December. As part of uh, one of the parallel events that were originally planned for the exhibition, the NIM team, which is Jens Kolakidis and Helen Black, and myself, had planned to invite uh, UC Parika for a lecture. This, uh, was this was impossible, of course, due to the measurements of the current COVID-19 pandemic, and we decided to have an interview with UC instead, and I'm very happy that uh, UC accepted this invite. And before uh, we dive into our discussion, I would like to say a few words about his work. So Yussi Parika is a writer and media theorist. He's a professor in technological culture and aesthetics at Winchester School of Art at the University of Southampton, and also a visiting professor at FAMO in Prague, where he's the director of the project Operational Images. His books and articles have analyzed accidents and dark sides of network culture, as well as digital audiovisual culture. Yussi has published extensively, and among his books are the titles What is Media Archaeology, Insect Media, A Geology of Media, A Slow Contemporary Violence, Remain, as well as Writing and Unwriting Media Art History that was co-edited with uh, Yoasia Krisa. Hi, Yussi. Hi, thanks for having me. That's, 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 that's really a uh, lovely intro, and it's always lovely to be in dialogue with you. Um, I was really looking forward to, of course, of the proper event in Cyprus with, with our NEME friends as well. But I'm glad that this is happening and this is a way of sort of a building on top of exhibition you curate, the themes that we were discussing with you as well and how it links to perhaps, well, as you said, my research, but also probably a lot of themes in general about art and design in the context of planetary crises, whether it's a COVID crisis or um, environmental crisis. Um, so I'm looking forward to this discussion. Nice. Okay, maybe we start from, um, let's say from the basics. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we start from um, something that is uh, fundamental, uh, I think, in your work and also uh, also was in a way the one of the basic relationships that we discussed in the exhibition, which is, let's say, the relationship of technology to the environment, or to take a step back, the relationship of uh, culture to nature or so-called nature. And um, if, um, I don't know if I know the date well, but somewhere in the beginning of uh, the decade, around 2011, I think, the previous decade, you coined the term media natures which was following, uh, in a way, the term of Haraway, uh, natural cultures. And uh, this was, uh, I guess, uh, introduced in order exactly to underline how the two terms are interlinked, um, how, in a way, they save each other's existence also. And um, I also now came across uh, another kind of um, interesting uh, kind of um, phrase that you wrote that somehow you uh, referring to McLuhan, who has famously said about uh, media being the extensions of men, you had said that the media are more extensions of the elemental. And I guess um, the elemental here has to do with the elements of nature. And um, I wanted to maybe start by discussing what attracted you to this specific field 10 or more years ago. Um, how did you see, let's say, central topics changing or not changing? I don't know. And what uh, kept you in uh, this field? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad that you already, when you were talking through, you mentioned the sort of a homage to Donna Haraway's work, for instance, as one reference point that was important for me early on, because a lot of the work over the past 10 years or 15 years or so has been building on various existing research strands around which I constantly have been trying to think of what is the media theoretical angle to this as well. Not that I was trained as a media theorist as such, but as a historian, but I early on started doing 
lot of work that relates to this entanglement of biology and technology and as such um trying to understand of what are the sort of underpinnings of a lot of complex technological formations that not only metaphorically hark back to um, um questions of nature but the ways in which it's been um, mediated through notion in complexity theory and other sorts of um, key areas of, let's say, um, modeling the world. So in that context, I, I, I worked a lot already on, on questions of animals and biology and technology and understanding what is the pol politics of technology understood through those formations. And, and, and somehow I then ended up working, especially in relation to these environmental materialities of media culture, which became increasingly important for my own work. And I'll talk about that a bit later, I mean soon. And, and then of course, uh, in a way became important academic and popular discussions over the 20 um, you know the past 10 years as well so it felt that there was a really strong resonance across various concepts like obviously the Anthropocene and its multiple variations um, in how I started thinking about terms like media natures so for me developing or thinking through concepts is one methodology of how to situate certain body of 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 conceptualization of, of thematization of problematics of, of for instance questions of materiality as well which was constantly the reason why i i was rerouting technology through biology or natural uh, in the broadest sense uh, whereas constantly told uh, of the issues at hand so if donna haraway's term was a great placeholder or you know marked a territory that um, you know gave us a way of understanding of the sort of continuums across so-called natures and so-called cultures and and underlying the sort of a primacy of artificiality but also the primacy of materiality of so-called culture i was curious of what sort of a small tweak is needed to make it even more relevant for and not just media culture in its generality of everything that is about media but through a couple of specific problems or questions so for me a lot of this was driven by an interest in electronic waste as a particular kind of a weird object of media culture and technology that was popping up every now and then and even over you know the past 10 years more and more in artistic and design works as well but it for me it was in originally already then um, a way of really kind of problematizing a lot of questions about um let's say durations and temporalities of technological culture and then trying to thematize such things like use and out of use for instance so really looking at and this again ties to my earlier work as well or what uh, what is the underbelly of technological culture that is read through moments of breaking breaking down and 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 moments of accidents instead of the idea that things work because they don't so it was in that sort of broad ballpark where media natures took took one place in my thinking well, as a sort of a alteration or variantology or variation on the notion of nature culture and not just that term but in a way i think one way of describing also what i was interested in is is what is media theory after new materialism and by way of new materialism I mean, by new materialism i mean especially the feminist new materialisms of of you know if we broadly read haraway there but also karen barad Rosie Braidotti's Deleuzian um, materialism, and then of course many other thinkers as well that are really relevant for our topic that we're discussing today as well, like Manuel de Landa, sort of a like idea of synthetic cultures that is persistently a key way of, of perhaps rephrasing some of the 
some of terms such as technology, but if we start talking about synthetic cultures in the broader sense as well. So it was that sort of a like, on the one hand, that moment around which, you know, new materialism was to me, especially really um, 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 crucial way of pushing some media theoretical questions forward. And then also how that pushing forward rerouted questions of ecology as they had been discussed in philosophy and others back to really concrete environmental issues. So it was a really kind of a like, even if I'm definitely not a philosopher, it was a way of mirroring certain formulations of conceptual work through quite concrete issues of planetary scale, like electronic waste. And then of course, like how it was building up after that, it's been also like that was the, that was the, what's the term that they used, the entry drug to uh, discussions of broader environmental issues as well that has become more and more the key key feature of my work as well. So you're really, and you, the way it was around 2011, 2011 when the media, media nature's term popped up in my work as well and, and started to uh, have its own gravity around which certain, again, I want to add this kind of a small note as well, concepts become in that sense work for me at least as gravity points as well that then other sorts of con you know, not just conceptual but source work like you know using sources whether that's a historical source like i do in some of my work but also like artistic projects or of keeping an eye on certain kind of artistic or design projects started to resonate so the gravity point of a conceptual work for me was also a way of sort of like mapping things in relation to particular problematics that I was interested in as well, if that makes sense, right? Um, of course, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I wanted to ask if actually in a way um, from the beginning you, you had the interest or you wanted to kind of address an invite to study together in relation to, in a way, different fields that would be, let's say, technology and geology. Um, this is something that, uh, of course, one could, uh, I guess, say, reading the geology of media, but also the Anthropocene, where um, you very much kind of underline how the geoph geophysical environment becomes a, a resource for um, technology, for technical media. Um, and of course, you have discussed a lot how Earth is basically what provides the affordances, what enables technical media to happen. And um, yeah, I was I was kind of thinking of that now that you were speaking, as well as um, the fact that in your work you have also talked about, um, uh, as you have said, the unsustainable and political dubious and ethically suspicious practices that uh, technology involves something that um, in a way also reminds me what uh, Yusuf um, has said when she kind of underlined you no know, geology is neutral in a way. So how we have to, uh, to, to, to take in mind consequences in, uh, in, in different ways and in political ways as well. So I was wondering mm -hmm. um, if, if, if this is, if, if I get it right, if there was such a, um, an intention and interest from your side to study these two different fields, one could say, um, technology and geology together or parallel to one another, and mm -hmm. if this was an an attempt, um, an invite to let's say revisit the perception of history and time uh, differently. Mm -hmm. I think that already crystallizes a lot of the things at that very junction of technology and geology, and how it then can be unfolded. And let me try to unfold it as well, or narrativize how it relates to notions of time and materiality. Also, just to kind of a nod, the, 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 when you earlier mentioned this, this anti-McLuhan take that I had, that's of course uh, in complete debt to Robert Smithson, who's, uh, who already pointed this, uh, this in his, his classic text, Sedimentation of the Mind as well. So it was, it's, it's already in that sort of a like, non-media theory context when we find that this different strand of thinking that that also bypasses not necessarily bypass in negative way but sort of a expands on McLuhan into 
um, 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 technology, uh, geological territory. So the sort of abstract geology that Smithson was after was also one thing that then started to me be a really interesting way of approaching geology proper. So indeed, Yusuf does it much better in terms of underlining the political uh, history and colonial history of geology as well. For me, if I start to or continue the narrativization that I had earlier as well, um, environmental waste, of electronic waste, was itself a way to conceptualize the so-called geological object of discarded technology as well. Um, but it also became a trigger then to start narrativizing of what would be a history of technology that would start from this un-entity or discarded entity of uh, electronic waste that itself is like a mini mine of, of various materials, um, rare earth minerals to valuable metals and others, and of course just plastics and toxic materials, how to unfold from there a conceptual but also an actual history of geology that becomes pertinent to understanding the history of technology or technological societies. That on the one hand, as Yusuf shows really well, relates to a particular understanding of, of, of extractivism, exploitation, um, that also, I wanted to underline with Anthropocene is a history of capitalism as such, uh, we, and especially we can put these two together, a history of racial capitalism as such as well. And that sort of a broad particular kind of a timeline to understanding technology and media technologies as well. So on, I was sort of a trying to see what are the key coordinates when trying to understand the two things here. So when we say bringing together geology and technology, we can already differentiate here between geology as it's being born as a modern science um, and, and its particular role as a Western science in that sense um, that had a particular relation to um, extraction and an extraction's role as part of a way of maintaining particular you know, power relations, as we know. But then also on a speculative level, geology as it refers to material histories or histories of material materials like metals and minerals as well. Not that it's it's separable, separate, separate from a political history, but they're like two parallel entangled strands as well that, you know, around 18th and 19th century, particular way of knowing about material histories and, and, and ex exploiting that becomes viable. And yet at the same time, like Manuel de Landa and others have argued as well, there's a, there's a massively long nonlinear history of geology that becomes gradually part of the ways in which our cities are being built, our cities operate, then later on our technological society operates, then the computer so, so, um, you know, society operates as well. So there's a whole, this completely real but mythologically sounding geological history that was of my interest as well in that context. And of course, besides besides this sort of a, like the key trope and very material trope of geology, it in my in my work as well, I was interested in quite kind of a like simple sounding but quite influential themes of what what does it mean to write media theory underground as well in relation to operations of mining um, but also other sorts of infrastructure operations that um, 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 puncture surfaces um, that 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 uh, operate in relation to emerging urbanisms and how they continue operating on a much much wider um, area than we usually read as as the operational area of media again as well so there was something of interest um, here that then connects to questions of in infrastructure infrastructure studies as well so those were some of the elements that that i wanted to bring into play as well um really anthropo anthropocene is is as such a quirky little wordplay but again, I want to use this as a particular gravity point um, with, 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 with underlining 
same 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 themes as Yusuf as well does. No geology is neutral. No technology is neutral. And in my view, this is really close to a certain Nietzschean, Friedrich Nietzsche, Nietzschean idea of will to power uh, in terms of both those scientific and engineering areas, and how we can start seeing those knowledge practices and material practices related to uh, questions of, of, of power and exploitations as well. Um, and of course, again, you mentioned the notion of time, and I think it's central to all of the things that I've said as well, because it's 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 underpinning the idea that, and sort of a, probably in certain ways resonates with this idea of Smith, Smithson's abstract geology as well, is that, you know, besides the tangible materialities that geology seems to be almost like, as a metaphor, like like others have pointed out, it's it's almost overly easily overly too masculine. Um, but at the same time, I kind of find the interesting things about it in terms of how it makes us think about different scales and different temporalities and different scales of temporality as well. So it became this double question: what materials define media, but also what times of materials define then the situation that we call media at the moment as well so again for me a radically different way of thinking about time than my training as a historian led 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 me to originally as well um to think of of questions of natural history as as relevant for questions of the artist artifice that is uh, media technological culture and how to bring that conceptualization of, of very different durations of nature and ecology into um, um, a relevant context of contemporary formations of media as well. So this was this was sort of like the short version of what I was interested in. And of course, it can be just summarized as, as a focus on temporality that is beyond history, that has its own media theoretical debates for years now as well, but I think it also found its way or found, let's say, felt natural to a lot of people working on questions of Anthropocene and others as well, because it's sort of a really seemed to feel like a completely different set of temporal coordinates as well, in terms of how we think about futures um, 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 beyond the usual scale of design and how we think about uh, material pasts as well as as they become actualized through concrete practices such as um, burning fossil fuels uh, as, as a sort of a like material but also temporal condensation of a particular disastrous moment that intensive intensely um, reformatted reprogrammed the planet and its atmosphere as well so there's a lot sort of a like the one leads to the other as well. Temporality is a way of talking about planetary durations and planetary durations are to be understood through the media technological episteme or epistemology that is essentially there. And that's why, again, as you early on asked the question, what is media nature is a way of understanding the material underpinning of media technology, but also that media is the techno epistemological framework in which nature becomes nature but also nature becomes resource and whatnot and in this uh, let's say discussion that also has to do with time mm -hmm. it's also kind of interesting how there is a certain circularity with all its problematics because of one hand we started also discussing of how earth provides let's say the affordances how it all depends on the ground but then also you brought in electronic waste and of course you have done so much work on that about so how it returns somehow in the ground and there is this um circle and um also this uh, notion that you uh, i think you mentioned the natural history of electronics um which kind of points to somehow how uh, the remains of the technological devices become part of i don't know if you can say that of the definitely of the environment uh, even the technological environment to an extent i guess Mm -hmm. um, and now this brought to my mind how you also have worked on, on the notion of remains. I mean, I have studied archaeology myself, but the tradition in archaeology, unfortunately, not uh, media archaeology, but mm -hmm. it still re refers to remains. Mm 
Um, anyway, so I, I find it uh, interesting how you kind of um, have worked on this notion from two different ways, but uh, expansively, I would say. Uh, yeah. so one has to do, of course, with electronic waste, and the other one uh, has to do with the great extent to what uh, uh, media archaeologists kind of single out, uh, take, and decide to keep for the as representative for the material culture of the present for the future. So mm. in a way, which is has to do more with our legacy, mm. has to do more with um, what is we acknowledge. I don't know if I kind mm -hmm. of understand it right. Also, by judging from your work, and I kind of find it. So it's like like I said before that. For me, also uh, reading your work, it has been very interesting to kind of get the chance to read geology and technology together. I also found it very interesting to how I got to understand together from different books, but still um, mm. how media archaeology and like this formation of toxic landscapes both have to do with the, the remains of technological culture. Yeah. Um, so there yeah. is this, this um, let's say, dual side which I guess it's also very useful, I guess, for um, um, the environmental studies and media studies of our times to kind of take in mind and see these two aspects together. Mm. Um, yeah. 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 And also like when you when you were talking, I was I was thinking of the various resonances here as well. Mm -hmm. Again, the sort of a, like even using notions such as remains. I mean, it has multiple connotations, um, and and I I was having this discussion about the remains as a as a term uh, with my French translator Agnès Viet, who's who's translating um, some of this work, and and she was asking of you know with a couple of of um, possibilities of what would be the best translation, and um, we ended up I think she ends up translating remains in French as rest. Uh, which has also this very sort of a like mundane connotation instead of remains as in the sort of a classical remains that are the sort of a remains of a museum collection or the sort of a remains in the sense of a usually plundered Western colonial collection. And this sort of remains is a very different, as I said, it's mundane, it's toxic mm -hmm. often, it's, it's something that defines a very different sense of cultural heritage if we can even say cultural heritage but we we must and it resonates closely with the sort of a phrase that is is quite quite lovely um and a book title as well by Anna Tsing and other scholars in a couple of years ago living on living on a damaged planet I think it was mm. but basically it is the same idea of what are the sort of a coordinates for our cultural concepts in the context of de facto toxic damaged environments, living environments that we live in as well. And how do we need to retune the sense of whether it's cultural heritage, whether it's the question of remains that sort of starts to speak to this de facto and you know damaged planet that is not merely there to sort of as, as a sort of a um, uh, as the other pair of a nostalgic ideal that there was, you know, ever a pure, you know, beautiful planet, but to recognize of how do we go forward from this place. So it's of course this already the idea of of this interaction between historical remnants and remains, and modes of futurity, is is at the core of you know classical works, whether it's certain works of archaeology or history or archival um, um, practices as well. But it also becomes an eth ethical mandate, I would say. So it gathers a certain kind of a particular strength in that sense as well, that it becomes an ethical horizon that starts to include questions like for decades have been done, but also with new and let's say resurfaced intensity now, the work that's been done by post-colonial and now decolonial uh, modes of knowledge as well of what and whose futures, um, whose catastrophes, which one of the ma many ends of the world um, are we dealing with and living in and orienting towards and acknowledging and towards and how do we 
negotiate questions of remains, for instance, in this context as well. And as you can see, there's sort of a very vague but implicit, but implicitly there dialogue between the sort of a modes of how we define heritage and how we define heritage that is of a really large planetary scale that has to go through these questions of, of really like um, privilege of memories and privilege of futurities and privileges of remains. And of course, in that notions that I use to remains, it's, it's a riff on multiple themes of media archaeology, but also trying to bring it in conversation with a couple of projects that I mentioned in that little booklet as well under the rubric of, of remain scattered. Um, there was, for instance, my, my colleague, artist and scholar Jane Birkin's work, who, who um, had curated um, an exhibition around questions of infrastructure of cultural memory. Uh, and then another artist group that you know well as well, Matallurgy, their work around particular collection practices and how that speaks to, let's say, question of remains in the era of Anthropocene, if one wants to put it like this as well. So I think a lot of these were all different ways of approaching, again, the question of cultural heritage and cultural memory as they've been re retuned um, and, and in the Anthropocene. And I'm not you know, now somebody would say, why are you even using that term? Because it's problematic, as many have pointed out, and it's true, it is. I'm just using it as a very generic term, and many have pointed out that it's, it's can, it can also carry very problematic um, ways of, of as if it's speaking on behalf of the humankind and such, but it's obviously the important work by Yusuf and many others have pointed out that it's it's much more punctuated history of the Anthropocene that we're talking about that is relevant also for the question of remains in the sense that I'm interested in as well. So I think there's something of a theme around Anthropocene and then the remains that sort of speaks to this as well. And I was hoping always that it sort of has the resonance with other, other scholars working on these topics as well, whether their scholars are not necessarily media scholars, but for instance, curatorial studies, art and design, or for instance, landscape studies as well. And, and this is where, of course, a lot of colleagues in landscape studies and landscape architecture have found the strong resonance with Anna Zing's work for obvious reasons. So I think that there's a lot of interesting things of how these in positive ways entangle and, and, and there's a new disciplinary alignments are also being born in this um, context as well. Yeah, yeah now that um, uh, you said that, I was thinking if we um, can talk a little bit about um, the, the role of art more specifically, because of course you have uh, closely studied the work of artists in general, and especially the ones that engage with environmental issues. Um, I was recently reading an article, an interview of yours, I don't know if it was recent or not, that you were uh, saying that art invites us not only to focus, but also to unfocus, um, somehow to, let's say, help us to locate, to, let's say, um, observe what is out of sight, realize what is out of sight. I, I kind of found this very useful. I don't know if you meant it that way also uh, in relation to like, to, to, to uh, the culture that we're now living in, that it's very much defined by algorithms. So somehow um, this kind of directly came to my mind of somehow mm -hmm. that art can help us somehow zoom out a little bit from all this pattern recognition, prediction, simulation, and so on, mm -hmm. although it's using it at the same time, of course, as a tool. And I was thinking, um, yeah, if, if, if you could uh, say some words about how do you think that art practices support or can support ecological practices and how do you see, let's say, arts models coming in and maybe pointing towards new forms of synergy with science and technology? Mm, yeah, mm -hmm. it is an interesting question um, for reasons that, as we know, the collaborations between art and science are not in themselves new and there's a whole interesting and not always unproblematic history of art and science as well. Like my colleague, 
Um, someone who you know well as well, Ryan Bishop has has done in his work as well as shown the sort of and many others besides Ryan as well, the, the the sort of a Cold War institutional context of a lot of the art and science work, and some of the problematic underpinnings of otherwise very exciting works as well. So, I've been interested in in the question of what is it now the sort of art and science work that specifically has had to retune. On the one hand, there's been the work of bio art, but in more specific terms, exactly the sort of a bio art that gets its hands dirty outside the labs as well in environmental um, and in damaged situations and landscapes as well. And I think that there's multiple ways of why it has become interesting. One thing, and it might sound obvious to many, but it's it's there's there's a particular role for artistic practices in facilitating interdisciplinary dialogues as well, and framing problems in ways that is not just aestheticization of any of this, but actually developing practices that are essential for understanding the complexity of issues at hand. So for me, for many of us, the 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 real um, benefits but also most interesting sides of artistic involvement is exactly in what methods are involved what are the processes in which we do things together how do we work in institutions and outside institutions and what are the particular models of artistic work in relation to institutions that are significant for knowledge about for instance climate change and biodiversity crisis and such so I find those kinds of questions super interesting and how a lot of um, artistic work is aware of that and is able to articulate its own role to institutions that they study or that they work with almost like as a recursive reflection of what are we doing here as well. Um, I'll mention an example. Um, I was, I was lucky to work with Geo Cinema um, artist duo um, during their um, um, Framing Territories project uh, for, I was, you know, they, they, the project was longer. I was able to work with them for some months and follow their work and be in dialogue with them as well. And I think it was a great example of their work that that um, relates, related and relates to um, the Chinese Digital Belt and Road um, infrastructure plans and its role in terms of earth observation and climate sciences, data operations. And I found the dialogues, but also the framing of GeoCinema, how they did this as super interesting as both reflections about not just ecological crisis, but the institutions in which ecological crisis is being um, made into a knowledge object and a knowledge object that has multiple angles it's it's it angles can scientific knowledge it can be science data it can be particular modes of imaging like i'm interested in my other current work on operational images so i think there's a there's this sort of a like prisms and and reflection surfaces that artistic projects are able to set up which with intended and unintended consequences of interest for for um, questions of ecology and, and, and climate change. And I'm very aware that there is a big role for raising awareness and all that. But to be honest, I'm I'm glad that we pushed beyond that because we have sort of a there's no question of lack of knowledge. It's a question of multiple other sorts of of things like how to action the knowledge how to be how to come up with actual concrete plans how to implement this into policy how to interact with policy makers and and, and also just asking constantly questions like what is the role of what we do in terms of the institutions in which we do it so that we can change also those institutions so it's sometimes it's this multi-scale question in order to you know we're talking about planetary issues, but also we need to be aware that our artistic work, academic work, curatorial work itself, you know, has a role to play in terms of changing those, um, you know, institutions, for instance, with awareness about whether it's energy 
whether it's other sorts of environmental implications. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think that's sort of a one entry point where it's it's some th somewhere between being interesting thematically, but also sort of a becoming itself a vehicle that that becomes methodologically interesting and and vehicle as as almost like you know methods as literally roots of how do we do things but then vehicles that take those roots but also vehicles to extend the metaphor that can take other people through through that route as well right so it's the it's the vehicle nature of interesting projects where you take other people with with you and show that look this is how it can work and this this becomes a really interesting theme for artistic work doesn't it Definitely, but I want I, I want to add because you didn't say it yourself that you also work closely with artists. I mean, you mentioned your cinema, of course, uh, but um, you also recently, for instance, co-developed an artistic work um, in a visual film uh, essay with Abelardo Zilfournier, uh, which was called is called Seed Image Ground, and which we also were very happy to feature in the exhibition or program in air. And I think this very much um, connects to your recent work that you mentioned on operational images. And um, and I, maybe I briefly also say, you will explain it much better, of course, that it has to do with the uh, relations between military aerial operations and agricultural techniques and the role of technology. But um, what maybe uh, would be nice to hear from you a little bit is like, um, how come and you came to work on Earth images, and how do you see um, they? How how let's say because images have always helped us understand the world. This is also what Prusser was saying in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but um, how how do you see this um, changing from the past until now, especially in the in the case of uh, let's say of the Earth images, of the images of the planet, because now we have images that carry information. Now that we, we have images that are computer generated, um, yeah, and maybe we can talk a little bit about how, let's say, the surface of an image relates to the surface of a landscape, as also you have discussed it a bit, uh, a lot in your recent work. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting link to the broader question of the whole um, your curatorial brief as well about reprogramming earth so perhaps we'll end up with also with reprogramming earth so yes as you said about seed image crown ground um it's a collaboration with abelardo and we've been working on a couple of things with abelardo that is both theoretical and artistic obviously he's he's the one that is bringing with the special artistic expertise, so uh, big hats off to Abelardo. But this one um, had a particular angle to questions of seed bombing and as such a certain kind of military metaphorics of um, vegetal growth. But we also want to reroute the question from the almost like the the, 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 the surface narrative of, of seed bombing and its military aerial vision and, and what that has meant as a particular form of imaging the earth as a target to the question of how does it look from the other way around. So in the images that our video essay is composed of, we sort of juxtapose aerial visions, but also laboratory images and other sorts of, let's say, almost like soil level images and uh, plant images. And we work with these juxtapositions as a way of also complexifying the idea of what does it mean to image the Earth's surface and image the surface as it's growing, right? So quite literally about plant growth as a as a key problem for agricultural sciences and plant physiology, and then how it's being developed as a theme that is is somehow really like philosophically entangled, but also quite pragmatically entangled as well. On the one hand, what why do we image surfaces of growth? Well, in order to understand what growth is and how to accelerate growth, which is a perhaps Weirdly enough, you know, one of the one of the biggest, you know, questions and political questions of past hundreds of years, or probably a bit longer than that as well, especially now in the context of biodiversity crisis and food crisis and 
any crisis, you name it, but in terms of living surfaces, right? And then the other way around of what is the image itself as an image that is about growth, movement, and dynamics. So on the one level thing that is quite more familiar to anyone working with heritage of experimental images as well. But those two things, they overlap very closely and, and they become also then situated in really interesting um, contexts like agricultural growth as well, which then is, is one way of thinking about what is, a, what is a territory, what is a plot, what is the surface as a place that can change and grow. And that is an interesting kind of an image in itself as well. And increasingly, as Abelardo has shown also in his own work, in other works as well, this sort of imaging of the plant uh, surface itself is literally happening in a lot of practices of, again, agriculture and, and including, for instance, precision farming and other sorts of like data intensive practices, which, which rationalize growth surfaces, but also doing that, they include a lot of imaging uh, techniques and data techniques as well. So it plays a lot with this circulation of images from aerial vision and drones to data to, to the plant level as well. And it becomes a way of perhaps responding to, and we were hoping that it also responds quite well to your idea about reprogramming Earth, right? Mm -hmm. which, which to me was super interesting way because it it both ties into this sort of a like cybernetic vision of the earth that can be programmed and reprogrammed but also at the same time it triggers a lot of other questions that are not merely technological in the algorithmic sense without ignoring it so questions of what is what what in which ways was the earth already programmed and reprogrammed through synthetic biology and synthetic chemistry as well and agriculture as well um, in which ways are we constantly reprogramming or need to reprogram the earth through um, definitions that are legal um, that are and other sorts of abstractions that have very concrete consequences like again privatization of particular crops or seeds and lands and such so there's a lot there that is about property in this sense as well and and legal terms as well and that's to me a very concrete way of extending the idea that has been circulating about um, law as code but actually it's much more concretely about also territorial management and definitions and then probably a couple of other ways as well of how we can define the ideas of reprogramming the earth that really relate to this both technological but also social and legal spheres of how we define and what definitions are the ones that matter, right? And matter in the sense have a trans transformative power uh, on the earth as well. And all of these images, and I guess you would you would be able to tell much more about this as well. All of these concrete images and ideas also they sort of a go a bit different way than the, the the way in which we used to think about the earth as an image right the classical you know photograph from this from the space sort of a imaging and this one comes really close to everything it comes close to the soil it comes close to plants it comes close to very situated territories um, territories situated you know places, um, historical territories and such. So there's something interesting there as well of kind of taking these kinds of images as the image of the earth in the context of, of all the discussions about Anthropocene, Gaia and whatnot as well. So, and I'm constantly interested in this sort of a like um, way of, of the image as it comes operationalized as, as particular ways, not always without problems at all. It's It's, um, there's, there's operationalization happens quite often through military or corporate institutions, but the notion of operationalization is to me uh, a key one to understand not just military operations, but multiple other sorts of regimes where images literally transform the world in which we are in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think you captured very nicely also um, what we aimed 
uh, with the NIM team uh, as part of this exhibition, which was in a way exactly what we were discussing together, uh, uh, let's say, in the beginning of the conversation, like the role of technology somehow. So we started with, uh, let's say, the dual role of technology in the exhibition, that on, on one hand, um, it's like it's trying, let's say, to trying to solve the problems that it created. That's the controversy there. And um, this is how, this is why the exhibition also was called Reprogramming Earth, trying to capture that as if it wasn't enough that the humans try to program the planet. Now the aim is to even reprogram it, uh, which is, um, of course, uh, discussed in um, books also of uh, scholars that have been published, let's say, the last couple of years, from um, Bratton's uh, current book, The Terraforming, to uh, Frederick Neyrat's Unconstructable Air, that they kind of capture exactly this this idea of that goes, takes us back to the cybernetics, as you said, that, here you have an object, a living body that you can take control of. And let's see for how long you can continue um, trying to control it and operate it and program it and reprogram it, reconstruct it, repair it. Um, yeah, I, I think there is a lot of human arrogance that one can, can see in, um, yeah, in these efforts. Yeah. But of course, where technology kind of comes in and plays a very big role. Uh -huh. um, and. Um, and uh, your work that had to do with sick bombing, uh, to my eyes, was also kind of uh, discussing this in a way. Um, yeah, and um, maybe maybe to close, I would like to ask you a, a last question about um, a term that uh, I heard you mentioning recently, and I didn't um, get the chance to understand very well because I also I didn't find, although I looked something written so much. Uh, which is the natural history of logistics. And I think that this is something that was developed uh, as part of uh, Benjamin Bratton's uh, current work and the school in, um, in Strelka. And uh, if I understood it, well, this has to do uh, in a way with this um, notion of programming or reprogramming the planet, um, pointing or aiming to discuss the role of design. Am I right? And what would yeah, yeah. Um, There's sort of a really bizarre hybrid term that also can sound problematic at first of natural history of logistics, which almost sounds like naturalization of logistics. Um, it was meant to do exactly the opposite with this slight, slight provocation as well, of, to understand of how particular modes of planetary power and hence terraforming, have been anyway harnessing and exploiting, and to quite often close, but not always the same, harnessing, exploiting natural processes. Um, whether we think about um, colonialism and trade winds or particular sea currents and other sorts of modes of transport or optimization and other key themes that seems to be defined in context of contemporary, often algorithmic logistics, and how to read back those terms of transport, optimization, rationalization, in terms of histories of colonialism, histories of terraforming as it becomes extending across the planetary surface. That was the sort of aim that I was trying to look at, and I'm trying to still think, I will still write it up as well, and I'm, sort of a thinking and and the context of why way it worked was also i was hoping to think of it as a quite a situated one natural history of logistics was originally a studio brief a brief for for the Stralka researchers so it was meant always as a sort of a like a what can you do with this idea in order to understand of what are the particular histories of terraforming for instance in relation to colonialism and what are the ways in which so-called natural things, processes of the planet, whether it's winds and currents and da 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 da, how have those been anyway been more in things we call cultures? It's almost like you can see this is a variation of Haraway's nature cultures as well, and I think it's definitely featured in our discussions with Srelka researchers when we were devising some of these as well, and 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 when we were the original, I then did a talk 
based on this idea, but also the original collaborative work with them as well. They it produced, it was very intensive mini brief, but it produced work that related to um, 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 seafloor mining, um, soil and commercialization of soil and, and sort of a fertility of particular soil types, um, particular forms of weeds and, and weeds as, as terraforming and all kinds of projects where we kind of observed the already, um, you know, happened forms of, of terraforming as, and, and natural processes and how they entangle with urbanism as well. So that's the sort of a backdrop to the idea as well. And, and I've been also recently trying to think this particular brief in relation to other, mostly design and architecture um, briefs that are speculative. Um, like like a wonderful brief at RCEA at Royal College of Art by colleagues there on atmospheres and politics of atmosphere and and and, and then um, some other works as well like the design uh, group design Earth as well and other 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 people who have worked with similar themes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Critical approaches. Yeah. yeah, exactly, and I guess exactly critical in the sense of also like. Mm -hmm trying to think of across scales and trying to constantly identify through material practices of what is the scale at which we need to be interlocking or locking into certain patterns that are seeing meaningful as well. What are the methods from for us in the humanities in the broader sense, inclusive of art and, and, and design, for instance, what are the methods of how we can lock ourselves into a particular mode of knowledge that are scientific in the broadest sense as well, and how do we how do we work with those without without being you know misunderstanding, but also exploitative, but also in a critical and creative way, um, 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 helping this to be those to be articulated, for instance, in questions of social justice, as we know, and environmental justice as well. The key themes that I know that you and I, for instance, are super interested in as well is, is what, are the, what are those resonances between um, questions of, of social and environmental justice and scientific knowledge as well, even if mm -hmm. you know, both of us have been also trained somewhere in between of those fields, but I think constantly trying to see of how to set up these dialogues between different yeah, knowledge practices. Great. Thank you very much, Yusu. Thank you. This was a really lovely discussion. We could continue um, a long time, but this is already uh, plenty. Yeah, lovely. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you very much. You.